I never get a chance to do unboxings, but I'm willing to make an exception here. This is a radio that Lisa picked up just a little while ago, and it is in a non-working condition. And when she told me about it, I said I'd be happy to look at it. She brought it over to me, and I noticed that it was in the original box and in the original packaging. It's an AM-FM Zenith unit, and it's uh, transistorized. It's solid state. Uh, it is definitely uh, vintage, but, you know, not tube. Uh, doesn't work at all, but the fact that it's got all of the original stuff in it is rather interesting. So I thought I would do an unboxing of this before we get started on this unit. The side shows it as a model E412V. And if we look down at the original uh, sticker, we could see that the original retail price was $32.95. And I guess there was a, a reduced price of $24.57. Looks like that. I guess back that's back when cents mattered. You never see that. Um, I guess this was a, a Zenith made in Korea at the time. I can't really put a date on it yet, but I will be looking into this model to find out where. Or it could actually be that this was <laughs> printed in Korea as, it, as it's labeled down there. I don't know where the radio is. As I said, I have not opened this box yet. I looked at it briefly uh, at the house, and now I brought it here, and I haven't opened it since. And the quality goes in before the name goes on. I know that this was true of early Zenith equipment. I know that's not how Zenith ended. Uh, there was no quality in Zenith, period, before or after the name went in. And that's pretty much why Zenith no longer exists, because there was no quality in anything. But back then, I mean, they were forced to be reckoned with. But let's, let's open it up. It tells you where to open, open from this end. And we have in the box... You know, obviously it has been opened before, but there is a operator's guide for those who don't know how to operate the radio. I'll place that here on the side. And then we have the radio in its original styrofoam packaging. Oh, just closed down there. And I'm going to take the radio out of that box. And we'll take a look at the book too. Seems to be a whole lot of fanfare going on with this box here. So for all the box aficionados, there it is. The box is made in Seoul, Korea, and that is the specifications of this cardboard box. They must have been really proud of their box manufacturing back then in Korea. Styrofoam is form-fitting and in good condition. I think uh, that's about as much as I could say about the unboxing of this. We'll get the radio set up now. The booklet supplies all sorts of wonderful general information about what radio waves are and frequency modulation, antenna connections, dial calibration and what have you and how to operate the radio which I would imagine is not entirely too difficult for the average person of at least moderate intelligence but it does talk about automatic frequency control as well which is a an option on this unit right here so you know it's good to have the booklets pretty cool uh, I will point out that in opening this radio, not only is the box and booklet made in Korea, it would appear that this radio is also made in Korea. Uh, by looking on the back of the radio, it reveals itself. We could also see that this radio was certified by Underwriters Laboratory. Serial number. Definitely a high serial number for this. They made quite a lot of them. I believe that's Canadian certification. Very good condition, mint condition. This looks like the kind of radio, I don't know why it reminds me of like a radio that would have been in my grandmother's apartment in Miami, you know, back in like the early 80s. I don't know, it's very, very late 70s, early 80s looking. It's pretty cool. I don't, it's, I don't know if the orange really shows up in the camera, but yeah, I mean, it looks br literally like brand new out of the box, this radio. Right here on the, on the uh, 104 and 108. Other than that, I can't see anything else wrong with this unit. It's literally perfect. Literally perfect. Of course, to remove the cardboard backing without damaging it, and that is done from the bottom. And you can tell because the bottom has the holes in it. 
the bottom has the areas that set it and there's one set screw that screw also holds the line cord and removing that and very gently working it it's unseated slides down the whole thing comes out and this is the radio yeah it looks nothing like a tube radio there is some however um, uh, equipment that we find some regular culprits like this right here this electrolytic capacitor it's going to be part of the power supply I see a couple of other electrolytic capacitors down there there's the uh, tuning gang right over here a myriad of adjustable coils here uh, some AM and some FM there is, in fact, a diagram over here. When this is removed from the chassis, we can see uh, which slug needs to be turned to calibrate which circuit. We'll work on that later. We're not concerned about uh, setting this up yet. We're concerned about seeing if we could get power to this unit. So, first things first. The antenna portion is conveniently socketed from the main board so it can be removed. I removed it from there, and that way we can get this cardboard piece out of the way. Got to pry off the front knobs too, and for this purpose I use my nylon uh, tweaker so I don't damage the plastic. I just get it under there and, and give it a little twist, pull it out. And both knobs are now removed. You can pull the radio from the chassis. I see what I believe to be three screws that hold the radio to the chassis, and they have those uh, felt washers all the way down there. It's hard to focus down there. Uh, there's one, and there's a second one. And I can't, there's the third one all the way down there by the tuning gang. And then we'll see if that releases it. If not, I'll search for a fourth. I was able to remove the complete radio from the chassis. I found it necessary to remove the speaker with the radio. It was easier than having to cut the leads to the speaker, which are soldered to it with a very short amount of distance between the wires. I put all the brackets and screws back in their original positions after I took the radio out of the chassis. Not only will it make sure everything goes back in their original locations, but it'll ensure that I don't lose them while I'm working on the radio. These pieces can now be moved away where they won't get scratched or damaged. I don't have to work on this stuff, so I don't need to be on the bench. Maybe the knobs, but not right now. Right off the bat, I'm seeing something here on this electrolytic capacitor that I don't like. And it's really hard to tell. Uh, this is all soldered like, like crap. And look at the bottom of this circuit board right here. Um, and obviously nothing oozed through the circuit board, so this is just like flux or they didn't clean the circuit board up and, and just give you an idea what I'm dealing with. So, you know, not, not a whole lot of quality in Korea back then, you know, but um, things like this, you know, luckily uh, they're very easy to diagnose when you talk about capacitor problems. But we have, we have these electrolytics, we have a lot of electrolytics. We're dealing with some, some extra circuitry, too, that I'm not used to seeing in, in, you know, older radios. But as far as power supply goes, these things haven't really changed at all. So we're going to get down into that first. Just out of curiosity, I ran a very low AC voltage through this unit. Uh, one that was safe, about 20 volts. And I did not see any current uh, get pulled when the power was on. Nothing at all. Zero milliamps. 0 0.00 milliamps and I started wondering to myself that's very strange to see no fluctuation so I had hooked up the multimeter uh, to the cord I tested one side which which I had uh, immediately found went to um, this resistor right here and that was fine and I stopped testing right there and the other side went to the switch and I went to one side of the switch and then the other and turned the switch on and off and that was good so I know the switch is working fine and I'm going to trace outbound uh, to where the other cable coming out of that switch goes to and see where that connects to see where this is dropping off and This 470 ohm Resistor here. It's a higher wattage resistor. I can't see the value right now, but I'm seeing wide open on that so uh, The other half of the line cord is basically coming in on This and it's being isolated. So that's why there's absolutely no power to the unit this resistor's open. I was I was actually hoping for more from this unit. Uh, hopefully I'll swap out that resistor. There'll still be some other things wrong with this, but uh, that's too bad. Looking at the schematic, I've confirmed this is a 470 ohm resistor. Uh, the 
k is poorly placed on this thing i couldn't tell if it's 470 k but when you look in the schematic you realize that there's no way you're going to drop 470 k right off the mains would be insane uh it turns out this is a five watt resistor all of the current that goes through this radio has to pass through this voltage dropping resistor it's a very poor design um I wanted to see, given the increase in voltage that we have today, I happen to have a couple of 250 ohms that I tied together in series to make a 500 ohm. The benefit to these 250 ohm resistors are is that I could put them in series to get a 500 ohm resistor, and both of them are 5 watt resistors, uh, though one of them is going to be used to uh, do most of the voltage dropping. So one of them is gonna be consuming uh, a good portion of the power, the other one's not really going to be. So in, in actuality, only one of them is going to be acting as a five watt resistor. The other one is just going to be a malaligned five watt resistor sitting in there. Uh, but that's fine for our purposes right now. Uh, what is going to happen is even though there's a greater amount of resistance in this circuit there are also higher uh, line voltages so we'll see if this fitting will work i've left it in such a way that it can be removed and the resistors need not be wasted that's why i have the tail sitting at the end of the circuit so that i could pull it out if need be and if it's not going to work i could just order up a 470 at five watts or perhaps eight watts and be done with it when I uh, get some voltage through here and start measuring uh, some temperatures, then I'll see uh, what has to be done. We're now seeing current flow. We're seeing uh, uh, 8 milliamps at 3.9, about 3.6 watts at a low voltage here at uh, 45 volts, or fluctuating 43, 44 volts. I'm liable to leave it there just for a little bit and watch the current Let's see what's going on. Ambient temperature of this room is 77 degrees, as you can see on the laser pointer right now. Those resistors, those voltage dropping resistors, are sitting there 85, 86 degrees. Some sections as high as 90 degrees. There's the bottom one. Top one. So yeah, I mean, and this is, you know, this is uh, um, two five watts, you know, eating comparatively 10 watts of power. So, still stabilized at eight milliamps. I just want to show because uh, eventually uh, a resistor can only heat up so much before it just starts uh, dissipating heat uh, through the ambient air. And these are pretty robust resistors obviously for what they're doing so i'm going to take my laser here and just show that the ambient temperature right now on the workbench is 76 and a half degrees fahrenheit and looking at the top resistor if i try and get it right there we can see it's about 98 99 degrees depending on where you are on the resistor on the flat face we call it 98 and a half right but if we look at the bottom resistor the bottom resistor is about 80 degrees because the voltage dropping and and the uh that's being turned into heat is being done on the top resistor obviously so we could see that you know obviously there's a disparaging difference in heat disparaging difference in work and voltage dropping right between the two of these i'm going to carefully ramp up the voltage on the variac a little bit and see make sure that the current flow is still seeing nothing going crazy uh, at this point once I get it past 60 or 70, I'm going to start listening on that speaker for some, some, some sort of sound, you know. I'm willing to bet there are some leaky capacitors in this unit. I'm hearing a slight hum coming from the speaker as well. Bottom one, still sitting at 80, doing nothing. So we're sitting at half voltage. Uh, it's showing 60 volts as measured, and it's a tenth of an amp. So six, 60, uh, 60 volts, 100 milliamps. Is what we got right now and boy that that voltage dropping resistor is cooking i've decided to pull out that electrolytic capacitor looking at the excessive current draw and see what's going on it was an easy pull so i did it gonna hook it up to the uh, it11 
I can't read AC because uh, AC and C being uh, 200 microfarads technically is off the charts, but looking at AB, B is showing 161 microfarads, where it's supposed to be 100. Doesn't instill any confidence. Uh, I don't believe I'm going to have any more success reading it on this machine. Its limitations also start to taper off around 50. C opened up on Electrolytic on 25 after a couple of seconds. Uh, that's a good sign for C as far as, as leak down goes. Uh, still can't measure it. But that's not the one that gave me concern on this was B. Let me move over to B. B is rated to 150 volts. Obviously C is only rated to 25. I'm going to switch over. We're going to ramp up B to 125. This is on Electrolytic, the worst setting. Here we go. That's 3, 6, 10, 15, 25, There's 50, we'll give it a second. Electrolytics could be slow. I mean, that's excessive leakage. This is this is on the electrolytic setting. Can it be reformed? We'll find out. I'll come back to it. This is like eight minutes later on electrolytic sitting at 50 volts, rated 150. This is what you call complete trash. And this is, um, this is what you would call extremely excessive leakage, and this is the 100 rated at 150 on the main power supply. That'd be enough to take down this radio and cause all sorts of terrible problems. Uh, luckily, I happen to have, for the 100 portion, um, this right here, this is uh, 100 at 160, almost an exact uh, drop-in replacement for the specification, and there was a uh, uh, 200 at 25, and I have a 220 at 25, much smaller. I'll be able to drop that in as well. Uh, I have available space because of the size of this unit that I will be putting, putting them in on location uh, from the top down and soldering them in. I'm gonna do that now. It's hard to see from this side, but the new capacitors are wired in. The bottom uh, uh, connection on the bottom left is the common ground where you could see uh, the two terminals tied in. And on the top and the right are the uh, uh, 100 microfarad and 200 microfarad capacitors. They're not getting in the way of anything. Nobody will be able to see them, so they're just fine by me. I wouldn't be surprised if there were more electrolytic caps to replace like this one, but I'm sure that that one's pretty much uh, the biggest offender out of all of them. Let's give it another go and ramp up the voltage really slowly on this and see if we get any progress. I find a schematic for this unit, but unfortunately it was only on radiomuseum.org which meant I had to jump through hoops and do a dance and go through whatever crap you have to go through on their website to be able to use an email address and download this and do that and weave it together and have my wife tape this one to that one. I, I just don't understand it. But anyway, I managed to get it done. And having the schematic, um, this part was worked on right here. I've annotated this as it existed on the original capacitor and this one this capacitor was bad at least at least one section of it was really really bad and when I turned on the radio I was hearing hum coming out of the speaker and that told me that I wasn't going to pursue this any further until I swapped those out and that hum coming out of the speaker was alleviated the radio still doesn't work but it's safe enough to work on now what I want to see is I want to see if I got some DC coming off of, of B after that diode at 501 and I could easily measure B by uh, measuring cross A, which I know to be connected to a good ground here, right? And they measure that ground as an audio ground. I could also grab one off of a chassis ground as well, since they're both uh, tied together across this capacitor 405. Or I can um, look at the uh, uh, voltage coming off after the 6.8K as well. But right now I'm going to look at that 80 and see what's going on. Because we, we've got some other capacitors here as well that haven't been addressed yet. And this one is a 1400 volt. So, like I said, all I worked was this. I'm seeing just about no DC voltage being read on B or C as measured to a reference of A. I'm going to try another reference, but I think we have other problems here. There's a 680K ohm resistor R502 tied in parallel to this uh, high voltage rated capacitor. I find I'm reading 60 ohms of resistance across this resistor and I feel as though I shouldn't be, especially when you consider the resistor just next to it at 6.8K. It's not as if there's a 
uh, a quicker path to ground unless of course something really weird were going on downstream like a combination of a shorted capacitor here as well as a shorted transistor here and a, and a shorted resistor here at 68 ohms right i mean i guess that's possible too um not likely could just be a bad resistor so the only way i'm really gonna know is to pull one side of that resistor take it out of circuit and see if it's really bad hey definitely not the resistor it's actually a bit higher out of tolerance it's not the point though something here is shorted to ground or very close to it gonna have to find out what I also decided for the convenience and safety of the radio that I was going to unclip the speaker until such a time as the speaker would become necessary. And even then I was going to connect it only with alligator clips. It was too clunky and short and it was probably going to get damaged or damage this portion of the radio while working on it. Now it's a lot easier to move around. Anyway, I've cleaned up these traces right here and removed a lot of the stuff that was there. Made sure there was no uh, shorted solder connections. And I'm going to test that um, voltage dropping resistor here, the 6.8. Uh, volt um, 6.8k 1 watt resistor over here connecting C and B together on a whim I figured the only other thing it could be is a broken diode so I took this diode out out of circuit so I could just be sure when I did my testing just slot the meter in diode mode and the diode is shorted uh, it reads nothing in both directions like a um, that just reads nothing so the diode is no good. Whatever hit this thing <laughs> hit it pretty hard and, you know, took out everything along the way. So, yeah, smoking gun. Uh, going to have to replace this diode. I'm going to have to see if I can find a comparable diode. I don't, I don't keep a lot of diodes on me, so let me see what I could find. Fair enough, it should come as no surprise. Uh, now that I look at this diode out of circuit and I measure it for resistance, and I'm saying this in both directions because it's not a diode, it's just broken. But it is the uh, it is the mystery 60 ohms that we've been seeing and wondering where where I'm reading it from. I'm actually reading across this broken diode as the path to least resistance. So yeah, I gotta find a new diode.